Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Gil, last name is Bobsky. Now, when uh, Ani saw my presentation, he asked me if it comes with an antidepressant. To test the level of depression prior to my talk and compare to the level of depression after my talk, I'd like to ask the following questions to you. If I offered any one of you a free ticket to Hawaii, for you and your wife and your partner, if you're single alone, or if I offered you a free admission to the hospital for the surgery, which one would you do? Are you satisfied with the level of depression before I start? <laughs> Let me tell you why I'm saying this. I believe, as Roosevelt said originally, that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And I believe that our medical leadership and political leadership and other leadership are afraid of frightening you. My position is you're already afraid enough. There's no way to make you even more afraid than you are. And the proof of it is that the alternative medicine is so popular. Everybody is trying any possible remedy short of going to the hospital. <laughs> so once we recognize that we're all fearful, there are quite a few articles about how fearful doctors are when their own family or themselves go to a hospital, and they know more than you do about the potential risks. So you can imagine the level of anxiety. So now let's, do, let's put things in perspective. It is not new that there are errors and complications. Marcy earlier said, to err is human. The Romans said that in Latin, it's errare humanum est. But the Romans also said, the physicians at that time, primum non ocere, first do no harm. So now the question is, how do we quantify the how compared to the benefits? <coughs> and we've seen a lot of statistics, and it reminded me earlier, a wonderful presentation of Arnie, Mark Twain said, there are lives, there are damn lives, and then statistics. <laughs> so I will start with some statistics. With the understanding that statistics can help us simply get a general idea, but I think we already got the general idea in this room. It was almost literally 120% of statistical anxiety, if not the 200%. So on the first slide, what happens when physicians strike to mortality rate of the population? But it happened in California, it happened in Belgium, it happened in Israel. Did mortality rate increase during the strike, <laughs> decreased, or was unchanged? Wow, we have a very powerful... Uh, well, we don't need someone to tell you that actually mortality rate decreased. Now, when you look into statistics and those that claim that those statistics are not accurate, they'll tell you that's true short term but not long term. Now, surely the strike has never been long term. It's been short term. Let's go to the next slide. Healthgrade is a publicly traded company that was asked to estimate how many patients die in the United States in hospitals alone from preventable errors and complications. We're not talking about errors that are not preventable. Only looking at 65 years older, Health Grade reviewed 37 million medical records over a period of three years. And if you take the numbers of errors and complications, pharmaceuticals, if you take in addition to nursing homes, surgery centers, private offices, and so forth, you come up to a staggering number of about 800,000 a year. While healthcare does terrific, incredible miracles, and errors are certainly a minority of what's going on. That little minority, in terms of cost, is astronomical. A human life is evaluated in dollars to be between four to nine million dollars value. How do we come up with it? I did not. It's an economist from Harvard and it's in a 70-page document. A human being is a consumer. 
A human being is a taxpayer. And over the lifetime of a human being, that human being represents four to nine million dollars. Anybody knows what's the total estimate of healthcare cost, the 15% of GDP, you know how much that is in dollars? Correct, about 1.7 trillion. <coughs> so it is inaccurate to say that healthcare costs 1.7 trillion, because you have to add up the economic damage of these number of people that die. Now you end up with 3.4 trillion, and now the healthcare cost is 32, 32 to 33 percent of GDP. So I submit to you that if you're really serious about reducing healthcare costs, I think you need to be serious about reducing errors and complications. Now, in the previous slide, we were comparing several countries. You have situations in our country where 83% of cardiovascular surgeries performed in a little village called Reading were performed on individuals that should not have had it performed. Now, imagine if you reduced the number of cardiovascular surgery from 100% to 17%, how much are you going to save? A lot of money. It is estimated in Belgium that about 30% of surgeries happen to be maybe not necessary. But that's not 83%. It's not 60%, which was in Modesto, California. So if we just reduced errors and complication by half in our country, we would just do as well as Belgium. But I submit to you that the United States has some of the finest, foremost medical schools in the world. This is also happens to be considered the wealthiest and largest economy in the world. And we have an expression, which is you get what you pay for. Why is that not true in healthcare? Why do I say it's not true? As much as Arnie is true about criticizing a lot of statistics, there's one statistic you cannot argue with. is the amount of dollars the United States spends per capita. And that's twice as much as Europe or Japan. And by all statistics and real numbers, which were recently compared just between the wealthy Occidental countries, and there were two studies on that, one from the OCDE in Paris and the other one from a Canadian study, I believe. But it was not comparing Canada to the United States. It was comparing the top eight countries, industrialized countries, the wealthiest countries, and the United States comes squares last. Many people think that if you are rich, you get better care in this country. Well, it so happens if you're rich, you get too much care in this country. <laughs> and too much of something is not as good as just getting the happy medium. You get too much care because you have good insurance, but you also get too much care because the physician or the hospital is afraid you're going to sue them for liability. Because usually if you're wealthier, you're smarter, you're more aggressive, and so your risks are bigger. Organizations supposed to control and monitor the quality of delivery of care in our country. No, something that I thought was like the FDA or the FAA. I reported the hospital to the Joint Commission. It was very significant. I kept calling that Illinois until finally the nurse realized I'll keep calling. Because, you know, when you send a stack or like this of documents, somebody, if they read it, will ask the questions, or else they didn't read it or shred it, one of the two. She finally tells me what it is. Dr. Milikowski, what do you expect us to do? We are a not-for-profit organization. I said, what? I thought you were a federal agency like the FDA or the FAA. No, no, no. I never even heard the word not-for-profit. I heard non-profit. So I said, wait a second. You, you, you're not United Way. You're not the Red Cross. Where's your money coming from? Please guess. I have a, a very good audience. You have a very smart audience. <laughs> so follow the money. What the Joint Commission has done in the last 20 years is actually caused the most massive consolidation in the healthcare industry and exacerbated the problem. <coughs> now, yeah, we're going to do that. What does the Joint Commission do?